Viruses like HIV, Ebola, and SARS that threaten mankind, and new viruses that break out every year. Every nation across the globe is supporting vaccine research to fight against this pain. There is an organization that works on the development and introduction of vaccines to protect the children of developing countries. Let's meet Director General Jerome Kim of IVI, the first international organization with its headquarters in Korea. He explains the role of IVI, the research and development of vaccines, and the efforts they put forward to help mankind. It's very nice to meet you, Dr. Kim. It's very nice to meet you, too. So we are here at the International Vaccine Institute, and um, this is the, the first international organization with headquarters in Korea. Could you tell us about uh, the role of IVI, please? OK. Uh, IVI was founded in 1997. Uh, it is an international organization with 35 signatory countries, including WHO, mm -hmm. World Health Organization. Uh, its mission is to discover, develop, and deliver safe, effective, and affordable vaccines for global public health. It's really a um, remarkable achievement because it's one of the few organizations around the world that's devoted itself to providing low-cost, effective vaccines uh, for diseases that uh, many of the larger pharmaceutical companies are not really concerned with. Mm -hmm. Because of commercial profit issue and... Mm -hmm. There, there are lots of reasons, um, but you know the diseases that exist in the developed world, and Korea is one of the developed countries, uh, no longer uh, trouble them. And so the vaccines that are needed in, um, in the developing world uh, are often very different. Uh, they cover diseases that we would consider to be diseases of travelers, mm -hmm. so typically a Korean or an American going to visit a country where uh, typhoid or cholera might be found. Um, so you're right, there isn't, a, um, there isn't incentive uh, for them to do it on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, there are some new programs that the developed countries have put into place that make it worthwhile for smaller companies to be involved in developing vaccines for what we call neglected tropical diseases. Mm -hmm. You seem to have a very busy schedule and um, I've heard that you spend more time outside Korea than in Korea, within Korea. So could you tell us a little bit about your role as the Director General? Okay, uh, so the Director General's role is, is actually one of the most exciting things I've ever done in my life. And, uh, but it does involve uh, a fair amount of travel because what IVI needs to do is both scientific and political. Um, from the scientific perspective, we have to establish credibility in a field, say typhoid or cholera or uh, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have to work uh, with vaccine developers, so that would be companies around the world uh, that are interested in developing vaccines for these diseases. And then finally, we have to work with governments. Mm -hmm. And working with governments does require a lot of face-to-face uh, -face interaction, particularly on the initial engagements. So for instance, uh, recently uh, we were in India because India, we're, we're hoping, will soon become a um, a funder, a co-funder mm -hmm. of, of the International Vaccine Institute. Uh, we were in Saudi Arabia to discuss with their Ministry of Health uh, what the potential for development of MERS vaccines uh, are. And then we were just in the United States uh, to try to convince them that it would be worthwhile for the United States to become a signatory. Because mm -hmm. of all the countries that have signed the IVI treaty, uh, there are no G7 countries. Oh. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> Yeah. So lots of work to, to do. A lot of work. Uh, well, uh, before we go into a discussion, our discussion in detail, could you tell us what vaccines are exactly? Ah, okay. Vaccines are a very interesting um, idea, and, and that is the idea that your body, when pr presented with the right germ or bacterium, will actually create a defensive response against mm -hmm. that um, germ and that that defensive response will then protect you from subsequent infection. And it's been known for a long time in many of the diseases of the past that if you got a disease, uh, that you weren't going to get it again. And so what vaccinologists did, um, you know, starting with Louis Pasteur um, back in the 19th century, was to take, to isolate these germs, show that they caused the disease, and then inactivate them. Mm -hmm. 
and inject them back into humans. Uh, and, and they subsequently found that many of these humans were immune, that is, uh, were not infected uh, by the germ. Well, it sounds like a great revolution that happened in human history. It is. Vaccines have, have contributed in a major way uh, to human health. In fact, when you look at the increase in life expectancy in many of the developed countries, it really is attributable to um, effective vaccination and the will of these countries uh, from a public health perspective to use the vaccines that were developed by science. But actually, you know, we're in an even more exciting time now. These new tech, you know, in the past we would you know, take a, a germ, a, a virus, or a bacterium, and we would put it in something that would inactivate it and we'd inject mm -hmm. it. And that system works uh, for a lot of the diseases. In yes. fact, um, it, it's really helped to, to revolutionize um, public health. But now, with all the techniques we have in the laboratory, we can actually take bits and pieces of viruses, we can assemble them into uh, new kinds of particles, we can actually develop vaccines within the course of months rather than within the course of years mm. or, or decades. So there's a lot of um, excitement in the vaccine field because we can do m much more faster than we could before. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a great innovation in vaccine uh, development. Um, as an expert in vaccine, um, what have we achieved so far in terms of developing and researching on vaccine? At IVI, uh, mm -hmm. we've worked on uh, three vaccines in particular. Uh, the first is a, is a cholera vaccine, and cholera you know, mm -hmm. doesn't exist in Korea anymore. Uh, there had been outbreaks here in the past. Um, we're in the middle of the seventh global pandemic of cholera, and it really does cause outbreaks all over the world. And we think that cholera exists um, in, a natural, in its natural state at a very low level in countries in Africa, in Asia, and South Asia. Uh, and then when um, something happens, typically a disaster, either man-made like or flood. natural, a flood or an earthquake, mm -hmm. uh, or if there's a big refugee population because of internal displacement mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, violence, uh, war, um, the setting then is, is perfect for cholera because it's transmitted through water and um, what we call fecal oral contact. And um, in those settings where people are displaced, hygiene deteriorates, sanitation mm -hmm. deteriorates, and cholera can spread. Mm -hmm. And it spreads very rapidly. Within the course of a few weeks, uh, hundreds of thousands of people can be infected and tens of thousands can die. That is, as we're trying to implement these um, special sanitation and hygiene measures. So in that setting, a vaccine, particularly the one that was developed at IVI, has some particularly uh, good <coughs> characteristics. It can be given quickly, orally. It's just you take the container, you shake it, and you have the person drink it. And the first dose appears to be effective in, in certain uh, populations. So that makes it even more effective. It sounds like it's a new way of giving vaccines to people because I remember getting cholera shots rather than taking it orally. <laughs> so that's uh, the difference between IVI developed vaccines. No, there are there are other oral cholera vaccines. Um, unfortunately, they're not ideal uh, for use in global public health because they have to be administered separately with a um, a second substance uh, that mm -hmm. buffers it. Um, the vaccine that was developed and now is actually not made by IVI, it's made by uh, Shanta in India mm -hmm. and by U Biologics, which is a small Korean company. Um, that vaccine is actually just a, a liquid that you swirl and resuspend and then um, administer to a person orally. Now, there are other oral vaccines. The rotavirus vaccine uh, is a classic one. The polio virus vaccine uh, was given orally as well. I see. So the mission of IVI is to give support to mainly developing countries. And how do you choose the countries you will give support? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so for the oral cholera vaccine, um, so typically if we were to develop a new vaccine, say we, we had developed the rotavirus vaccine, we would actually have to create a use for it and, and get people to start using it. Now with rotavirus, it was very easy because rotavirus is a major cause of, of diarrhea in children. Mm -hmm. With cholera, it's less clear because cholera appears in these giant epidemics and outbreaks. Um, you know, Haiti would be an example. Rwanda would be another example, or uh, Democratic Republic of Congo would be another mm -hmm. example. But in its natural state, it causes um, small uh, clusters of infection. So, say mm -hmm. in Malawi or Mozambique, um, you'll see in a small outbreak. There's, they're having an outbreak now in Kenya uh, in a refugee population. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't see it in these big outbreaks um, 
unless there's a, some other precipitating event. Um, so to get the world to use cholera vaccine, we have mm -hmm. to actually demonstrate that it works in places like uh, in India or in Bangladesh, and really show that by increasing the use of the vaccine, that we have a demonstrable impact on the amount of cholera that they see, and then on the amount of cholera uh, that's transmitted to other uh -huh. people in, in, in the area. It's really interesting when, when we do a vaccine test, right? We, mm -hmm. we compare the vaccine against an inactive substance called a mm -hmm. placebo. Mm -hmm. When you do a cholera uh, vaccine trial and you give cholera vaccine to a large number of people, the people who get placebo appear to be protected for a little while also because the vaccine is so effective in decreasing cholera in the population that was vaccinated, there isn't transmission of cases into the unvaccinated population. Because they're located in the same region. Because they're located in the same region, exactly. Oh, I see, I see. So um, at, at your inauguration as the Director General of IVI, you said that it will be very important to involve many different sectors in Korea, such as academia, research labs, and the corporate sector, and also the government. Mm -hmm. Have there been any achievement in this regard? Have you been utilizing this kind of network? So we always use the network, and then in, in part that's why um, I've, I travel a lot, or, and actually the other people at IVI also travel a lot, um, because we have to engage with partners all over the world. So um, within Korea, um, our, we have a very strong relationship with SK Chemicals and the smaller company, Ubiologics, uh, but we have other significant relationships with companies. Um, PT Biopharma, which is a major provider of vaccines for global public health in Indonesia. Um, several of the Indian companies, including Shanta, uh, a small, Viet actually it's a state-run Vietnamese company called Va Biotech, um, and then a brand new vaccine company called Incepta in Bangladesh. And so we work very intensively with these companies to transfer the technology to manufacture particular vaccines. Uh, and then we um, work with them through the process. In fact, it depends on the company, but uh, with some smaller companies, um, and working with the Gates Foundation for funding, we're able to help them commercialize the vaccine. We're able to help them get through the things that are necessary to get World Health Organization approval for the mm -hmm. vaccine. Well, it sounds like it takes the whole world to work on vaccine. <laughs> That's I right. Think, um, you have partly answered my next question already, but uh, other than the government source, uh, what kind of sources are there for funding uh, for the research? The uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has really revolutionized global public health by focusing attention on it, but not only attention, uh, but providing funding and mobilizing other funders uh, like Warren Buffett, for instance, uh, to help support uh, concerns in global public health. And vaccines are a principal part of their concerns because vaccines are one of the most cost-effective measures for mm -hmm. prevention of disease. Uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation provides about three-quarters of our funding, although recently um, Samsung has pledged an additional um, very large amount of money to support the development mm -hmm. of vaccines against the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Oh, I see, I see. Well, um, this might be a very naive question, but I am curious how much money and time will take to develop a single vaccine? So that's Depends. a very, it, that's a, a question that can be very complicated. For instance, um, you know, I've been working on HIV vaccines for a long time, um, since 1989, and, um, and we still don't have a vaccine. And the same is true of vaccines against the other two major diseases of global uh, public health concern, malaria and tuberculosis. Uh, there are some vaccines for, there is a vaccine for malaria that has been approved, um, but its level of efficacy is, is still a bit low and they're working very hard to try to make that better. In that case, you can spend decades and billions of dollars and we still don't have vac um, generalizable public health vaccines uh, for, for HIV or, or tuberculosis, for instance. On the other hand, for, for the oral cholera vaccine, uh, we spent a little under $50 million. Um, mm -hmm. But again, it did take a long time. It took um, about a decade's worth of work. Wow. Um, working with, I mean, and, and it's a very long story about, again, a, a mm -hmm. really important collaboration, a laboratory in Sweden, uh, transferring something to Va Biotech, which was then transferred to IVI and improved, uh, transferred back to Va Biotech and other companies around the world uh, for manufacture. So again, it does take a while, but you know, big pharma, uh, these large pharmaceutical companies say that it costs between 500 million and one billion dollars to develop a new vaccine. Um, it is possible to do it for less, 
Um, we don't cut corners. But in fact, uh, we don't take the risks that a big pharmaceutical company takes when it makes a vaccine. Wow. So after you inaugurated as the Director General of IVI and stationed in Korea, um, there was a huge outbreak of MERS in Korea, uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, I understand. And uh, we were very surprised that a country with relatively advanced medical services can have that kind of problem. So what is MERS? Could you tell us? So MERS is, is one of a group of viruses that exist um, throughout nature in animals, like uh, SARS, which you may recall from over a decade ago. Right. And um, one of the unfortunate tendencies of these uh, viruses is that they often make a jump from animals into humans. Now, that actually isn't all that uncommon. Influenza, as it's circulating, as new strains are developing, mm -hmm. are, is transitioning between ducks or, and pigs and, and humans. So that happens all the time. Um, with MERS, really, you know, it, it doesn't tend to occur, except, for instance, in the case of SARS, in these massive outbreaks with, hu with very efficient spread from one human being to another. There is transmission from, say, camels to humans, uh, and then from human to human in particular settings. And so this may give you a clue as to why it happened in Korea. It happens to be transmitted particularly well in hospitals, where the intensity of exposure to a person who's coughing, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, may be significantly greater. So if we look in Saudi Arabia, the vast majority of cases occur in hospital settings, which is where they occurred in Korea. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, Every epidemic surprises us, and maybe that's, um, we should expect that, um, but there's, it's impossible to, although we can expect it, it's impossible to predict it. Mm -hmm. So as the outbreak was occurring, the Korean government was gaining experience in dealing with an outbreak like MERS. Mm -hmm. um, it, it always teaches us a lesson uh, and teaches us uh, humility. I mean, Ebola did the same thing. Um, and it really teaches us the limitations and the importance of simple things that protect healthcare workers against uh, the spread of infections. Um, we are working on a vaccine. Uh, actually, a lot of the work recently has been uh, with the government of Saudi Arabia, with companies, uh, with the World Health Organization, to try to identify the possible candidates for vaccines and then to set into motion uh, the plans to test, develop and test those vaccines. Uh, so, because Korea fell as to a victim of this MERS outbreak, I think it would be wise to invest in the development of uh, MERS vaccines. Are there any concrete cases which are undergoing at IVI? So, um, we are starting the process now of selecting companies to work with. Uh, and also, one of the companies actually should start a trial using the same vaccine in the United States, uh, we think in January. Uh, Korea should, we hope, follow very closely behind with, a, with the first of these candidate vaccines. Um, and hopefully the world will begin to be able to test a number of them. The biggest issue here is that for diseases like MERS, which occur in, in these small outbreaks um, that are you know, very catastrophic, billions of dollars were lost during the Korean outbreak, um, we have to be very careful because we have to be very uh, good stewards of the, of, of the funding that we get. We have to make sure that results that we do in uh, trials that we do in Korea can be compared to trials that are done in Saudi Arabia or in America. In order to do that requires an unprecedented amount of co cooperation and collaboration between groups. And I think you know, IVI hopefully will be able to bridge between some of these groups to get a data set that everyone can look at uh, that will speed up rather than slow down the process of vaccine development. Uh, again, a question from a, a person who doesn't know anything about the field. Uh, would the same vaccine work for the MERS outbreaks in different parts of the world? That's the hope. Um, as far as we can tell so far, um, the antibody, many of the antibodies that have been developed, so antibodies are proteins that your body makes to bind to and inactivate viruses or bacteria. Um, when they look at the antibodies that are made in people infected with the MERS virus, a lot of these antibodies will protect against the other MERS viruses. What we can't, so we think that a vaccine should be, if, uh, we should be able to develop a vaccine and it should be relatively simple to do that on the one hand. On the other hand, remember that the virus isn't efficiently transmitted from human to human. But if the virus were to change and now be efficiently transmitted from human to human, um, we hope that the vaccines would protect. There's some suggestion that they would, but we can't guarantee that. So, you know, we have to be ready to test. We have to be ready to adapt to new situations. And I think, and that's what's exciting about 
uh, medical research. Unfortunately, you know, we, we would have to be in the, in the epidemic. We have to be able to test the vaccines during outbreaks. Uh, and this new plan that the World Health Organization has um, that IVI is participating in um, will hopefully now begin to put into place the things that we need to respond quickly to, ep to epidemic outbreaks for which no vaccines are currently approved. Mm -hmm. I wish you a great success on the development Thanks. of virus, uh, I mean, vaccines for MERS. Uh, would it help Korean economy as well if we are successful? Uh, for the MERS vaccine, you know, so MERS vaccine is, is very unusual at this point. You know, it occurs in these small outbreaks. So the actual use of the vaccine has not been worked out. So for instance, we can't tell you that how much a vaccine would be made or how much that vaccine would cost. I think that MERS um, vaccines could be important because countries may, be, uh, may want to stockpile it or the World Health Organization may want to do that. But at this point, we're not thinking that unless it transitions to an animal vaccine, so again, you could think about vaccinating camels uh, rather than vaccinating humans, um, that there is a, a large market for it. Um, but I think that what's more important is that the lessons learned in the rapid development of vaccines against MERS can be used for other vaccines in the future. I see. So it could be direct or indirect, uh, the right. contribution. Um, following MERS outbreak, uh, 55 people at Kongguk University research labs were infected with pneumonia this year in October and November. And researchers found that uh, the germs from the animal feed might have mm -hmm. uh, caused that problem. So uh, is it possible to have this kind of new epidemiological incidents uh, all the time in the, in the... So I think um, for those of us who uh, try to stay, keep up on, on these things, that there are um, outbreaks of diseases um, all the time. Um, some of them are more worrisome than others. You know, at, at, in, 19, in 2012, when MERS was first uh, discovered, it wasn't clear what the extent of, of the disease was. And now, as we've been able to study the global epidemiology, I think there's increasing concern uh, that now with about 1,500 cases uh, and 40% um, death, in, in, not in Korea, but in other parts of the world, uh, MERS is something that really has to be tackled. Um, for the outbreak in Korea, uh, the more recent one, it isn't still really clear to me exactly what caused it. They identified a, a, a bacterium, a germ, um, from a very unusual uh, group of organisms called actinomyces. It actually, this particular group of germs actually um, is uh, the source of some of the antibiotics that we use uh, commonly today. Um, and the, the reactions uh, that were developed against them, which we call hypersensitivity, are a little different from infection, which mm -hmm. is what was um, suspected in the, in the outbreak at the university. Mm -hmm. So it, I don't think it's all worked out uh, as well yet, but it's, I think, something that's very interesting. And you know, I, again, the lessons learned during MERS um, made the Korean government much more aware, and you know, they had daily updates of, report, of reports, and, um, and they really went through a very comprehensive list to try to make a diagnosis. So again, I think there was a lot uh, learned and you know, I, that was the most important outcome, I think. Of so the we MERS. need to learn from those uh, outbreaks of uh, these right. epidemics. Um, I've also heard about your recent project in Ethiopia. It was a, mm. sort of a disease prevention campaign in Ethiopia. And in addition to the, the regular awareness raising campaigns, you distributed soaps to the students in Ethiopia and other uh, disease prevention measures. So is it important to have these kind of practical measures? Yes. So, you know, we often say that vaccines should never be uh, the only thing, that they, mm -hmm. vaccines are a part of a more comprehensive program. Um, of prevention. And in the case of um, something like cholera, um, it's very important. Hygiene and sanitation are, are anchors. I mean, that's, that's how Korea got around the problem of, of cholera, by uh, increasing its level of development, improving the water supply. Uh, mm. In Ethiopia, again, in combination with vaccines, effective measures um, for personal hygiene and then uh, followed eventually by uh, improvements in sanitation and, and other um, infrastructure improvements. Um, we think that cholera will disappear from there also. But it was thanks to LG that, that we were able to do that. 
So it's, it's very interesting to hear that such simple measure as washing hands is, is <laughs> important, still very important. And we should remember uh, that during flu season as well. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Um, now let's talk about you as an expert in the field of vaccine and you are a medical doctor as well. So uh, I was, I'm very curious about what were your achievements and work like before you came to IVI? I was a, um, in H I worked in HIV vaccines, mm -hmm. uh, and as I mentioned previously, you know, we've been working on them for a long time. Um, when, we f when the HIV virus was first identified, um, there was a prediction that we would have a vaccine in two years, and you know, that would have been the late 1980s, and as you know, we, we don't have one yet. Um, the vaccine trial uh, that I was involved in, which occurred in Thailand, in, in Thai men and women aged 18 to 30, um, showed protection of about 30 percent, yeah. which is, as we say, not good enough for, for public health use, um, but it had some very interesting um, findings. And, and the beauty of science is that we can take those small findings and learn more about what made it work. And so what followed on in the next two years was a very broad international collaboration involving almost 30 universities and you know 50 scientists and uh, technicians and, and others. And we were able to, to figure out how the vaccine worked. And that actually is important because it now allows us to screen future vaccines and to maybe design new types of vaccines that emphasize or that will increase the amount of that uh, protective antibody that we, we saw. Um, I think uh, HIV vaccines are, are on the verge of something that's very important. Uh, we're now increasingly seeing um, the improvements in the vaccines that are being developed and, and hopefully within the next few years another vaccine trial uh, will go forward. This one now aimed at, at achieving between 50 and 70 percent efficacy uh, in protection against infection. Although it is improving now, uh, still many people are suffering from AIDS. So as an expert, what's your prediction? When will we be free from AIDS? I think that um, too many experts have tried to make that prediction and have been wrong. But uh, the World Health Organization would like to target uh, 2030 as mm -hmm. the year when you know, we have AIDS under control. Um, with the modern treatments though, people who have HIV infection um, will remain alive uh, and live normal lifespans, which I think is, is really a remarkable change from when I start, first started seeing people with HIV and AIDS and then first started treating them. Um, but that also means that we will have people um, 80 years from now with HIV virus, and if they stop taking the medicines, um, the virus will come back. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that what we're, we, the next step, um, other than an HIV vaccine, is to work on something called the cure. And there are a number of groups throughout the world that are um, using what we call the collaboratory um, collaboration. So that is a number of very big laboratories linked together by a common uh, set of scientific uh, objectives. And it's these collaboratories, I think, that will help us to solve the, the big science problems, not only in biology, but in other things as well. Well, it sure is a big change from a death sentence to a manageable condition, but uh, we also have a lot, uh, a long way to go. We really do. Curing the, the, the disease, I guess. We do. Uh, and, and, you know, throughout the world, there's still a, a shortage of medication. There are still people uh, who have HIV infection who meet the World Health Organization criteria for treatment who aren't able to access care. And I think, you know, the world has a lot uh, to do to be able to provide the medications and treatment necessary to really control HIV. Wow. So before you came to IVI as the Director General, you were already an established expert in the field of AIDS vaccine and you had your good life as a researcher and also everything. So it must have been a very a uh, big decision to come to IVI. Uh, was there any particular reason that affected your decision? It was an easier decision than, than, is, <laughs> than is really <laughs> apparent. But you know, I think that being an infectious diseases doctor, um, vaccines have always been a very important part of, of our armamentarium, means of fighting uh, infectious diseases. So uh, HIV vaccines just happened to be the area that I, was special, that I specialized in and, and will hope to continue to work in it at some point. But um, IVI's mission really attracts people who are optimists at heart 
or, and idealistic who really believe that uh, vaccines can and should be made available to people around the world. I mean, really, you know, when you think about um, these large displaced populations, hundreds of thousands of people living in refugee camps and then having a disease that we can prevent with a vaccine and hygiene, hand washing and other things, um, it really touches you. And I think mm -hmm. that the people who work here um, really are affected by the idea that we are actually making a difference, that we can actually help companies around the world make vaccines and that these, these vaccines will ultimately have a public health impact. Wow. So uh, actually, uh, there were several magazine articles at the time of your inauguration as the director general about you and your background. And one of the, the aspects of your background that many Koreans were impressed was that you're a descendant of a, a Korean who lived in Hawaii and who was also one of the leaders in the Korea's independence movement uh, during the Japanese occupation. Did that affect your decision? It did. Um, coming back uh, to Korea, I think was probably one of the most important decisions that that I've made. And, and my family uh, agreed and, and agreed to come. Uh, my wife is actually very excited about uh, coming as well. Um, it's to find out more about um, the, the history and the culture of the, of the people um, uh, that my grandfather uh, left. Actually, uh, he fled the country uh, mm -hmm. to escape the Japanese. Mm -hmm. So, and then went through uh, Russia on the, I guess, the Trans-Siberian -Siber Railroad mm -hmm. and departed England for the United States. Actually, I found out from a cousin last week mm -hmm. that they found my grandfather's entry into Ellis Island wow. and the ship that he was on and the port of, of embarkation in England. Um, and then he went to Cornell and Ohio State mm -hmm. and then to the University of California, Berkeley, uh, got involved in the independence movement and eventually moved to Hawaii. And I would suspect because, well, my grandmother was from Hawaii, but also um, because there were a lot of Koreans there. And if you were going to organize an independence movement, what better place than where uh, there were Koreans living outside of Korea? Your grandfather's name was uh, Mr. Kim hyun gu and he wrote an autobiography as well. Do you have any personal memory of being with your grandfather? I do. Uh, so I, I was one of the, um, the last of the grandchildren that he really um, interacted with a lot. And um, because I was little, he would take me um, uh, on the bus and um, to work. And then, and I remember this particularly well because there was a candy store on the way back. Mm -hmm. And we would always stop there uh, and I would always get something. <laughs> a doting grandfather indeed. Yes, he was. And, oh. um, but I think the thing that, that I remember the most was um, his writing on this very thin paper, uh, just with a simple pen, um, and I couldn't read his handwriting. Mm. Well, of course, it was being written in, in, in calligraphy, in, in Chinese script, and so when they translated it at the University of Hawaii, they needed some assistance um, because this form of calligraphy was not easy to interpret. I see. So deciphering the Chinese characters, yes. and then that was translated. So did you read his autobiography? I've read the translation. Uh, and I actually, I, I didn't realize the first two chapters were about his family, um, his ancestors, and then his immediate family. And I've given it to my daughters to read because I think I, I learned about it fairly late in life. I it was in the 1990s, so the book had been published a decade earlier. And, um, but it had a, a summary of the, of the people, um, his ancestors, and then his father and grandfather, and, um, and the roles that they played in Korean history as well. So I think that was very exciting. Oh, I see. Well, this is very Korean, but uh, another aspect of your background that many Koreans are impressed is that you and your brother and sister all were highly educated and graduated from very prestigious schools. Were there any particular sort of philosophy regarding education in your grandparents' generation or your parents' generation? Of course, in my grandparents' generation, um, my, my grandfather um, was very highly educated, um, both in the traditional Neo-Confucian um, classics, but also then in philosophy um, in the United States. And actually, my grandmother was also um, sent away to college, and she got married and, and dropped out. But I mean, there was always an emphasis on education. Um, among, in my own family, um, my mother and father both really strongly emphasized education. 
and um, to encouraging us to, to, to do what we do best uh, really, really helps um, foster the idea that, mm -hmm. um, that education is important. Um, and there are lots of other students who are interested in becoming medical doctors like you or more specifically vaccine experts. Do you have any advice for those students? Um, medical school is a great way. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm a medical doctor and I think it gives you a lot of flexibility. You can, do, you can take care of patients, which is something I, I still enjoy doing. Um, you can teach uh, or you can do research. And, um, you know, we would really strongly encourage um, Korean doctors who want to do vaccine research to come to IVI because uh, we have no end of projects uh, all over the world um, that we need experienced, uh, hardworking, intelligent people um, of all sorts um, to, to work on. But I think, you know, for, for any young Korean scientist, um, look at the big problems, uh, work hard, try to develop an intuitive understanding and ask big questions about um, important diseases. Mm -hmm. With the outbreak of Ebola and MERS virus, uh, uh, I think it's all the more important that uh, at IVI you do research and develop and providing good vaccines for people all over the world. What are your future plans? So IVI, um, we, we've just undergone a, a big strategic review. So besides um, continuing to improve in cholera, typhoid, and, and dengue. Um, we've now taken on uh, MERS coronavirus vaccines. Uh, we're hoping in the future to work on vaccines against other forms of um, diarrhea that occur, occur in children, such as rotavirus uh, or uh, what's called norovirus, which has caused outbreaks here in Korea. Um, we would love to uh, be able to work on uh, vaccines against tuberculosis or HIV, other big problems uh, around the world. And then, um, you know, probably one of the biggest problems, and you won't ever hear anybody talking about this, is, um, is plain old-fashioned um, pneumonia. So we call it um, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. It doesn't sound very sexy or, or scientifically <laughs> interesting. Can't but even it, imagine what the meaning is. <laughs> right. So it's a vaccine against uh, one of the most common forms of pneumonia, and particularly a problem mm -hmm. in children and in the elderly. Um, and it turns out that uh, the Global Alliance for Vaccines spends 50% of its funding purchasing uh, these vaccines uh, for use around the world. But the vaccines has a, have a tremendous effect. In one country, when they implemented vaccination in children, overall death rates dropped by 16%. Wow. It's a really remarkable vaccine, but it's very expensive. In the United States, you could pay $200 a dose. And the goal is to get the cost of that vaccine down to $2 a dose. How does, is it possible? So you work with companies uh, mm -hmm. that will create similar vaccines. Uh, then you have to show that those vaccines uh, will actually protect people. And then the companies um, will typically commit to the Gates Foundation or, or other funders uh, to make the vaccine available for as low a price as possible. And uh, it's those combined efforts, companies, foundations, universities around the world, um, that will now be able to lower the price of pneumococcal conjugate to, to a point where we can now afford other vaccines because Gabby's money isn't being spent entirely on pneumococcal conjugate. It isn't a scientific problem, mm -hmm. um, but it is a problem of manufacturing, of supply, of, of getting through the process of getting a vaccine approved. So through this interview, I think I've gained a lot of information and have an in-depth sort of understanding on this important issue. Is there anything that you'd like to add to the viewers? Okay. Organizations like IVI exist um, because of the strong support of countries um, like the government of Korea, the government of Sweden, um, and our other signatory countries, from the support of foundations, um, you know, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the Samsung uh, Group. And also, um, you know, we depend critically on support from people in India, uh, in Korea, in Sweden, uh, and throughout the areas where IVI works, Nepal, Malawi, Ethiopia, I mean, all the work that we do depends on support that we get from, from the world community. And so if we can continue that support, if we can strengthen it, that would be a wonderful thing. Well, that's all the time that we got for this interview. And I would like to thank you for being with us and share your insights on this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.